Hello, and welcome to our webinar, Disney Publishing Worldwide Preview. I'm Julia Smith, Senior Editor, Books for Youth at Booklist. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some technical details. The audience is in listen-only mode, but we welcome any questions you may have. On the bottom of your screen is a toolbar with a section for Q&A. If you have a question or need technical assistance, simply click Q&A and type your message message into the box that appears. We will do our best to respond to all tech-related questions and we'll pass along all other questions to today's panelists so they can follow up with you after the webinar. Links to today's slides and title list were included in the reminder email you received from Zoom one hour ago. To download them, please open that email, scroll to the bottom, and click on the links located there. You can also download these materials at any time by copying the URLs on this screen into your web browser. We will now move on to the book buzz portion of the webinar, for which I'll pass things over to today's Master of Ceremonies, Dina Sherman, School and Library Marketing Director at Disney Publishing Worldwide. Thanks, Julia. We are so excited to have you guys here with us today. I wanted to give a quick overview. The preview today is going to be in three parts. We're going to start, as Julia mentioned, with the book buzz of upcoming titles, and then we'll follow with two panels. In the interest of time, I'm going to take a moment now to introduce all of our presenters. So first up for the book buzz, we have three members of our amazing editorial team, Heather Crowley, Christine Collins, and Cassidy Leyendecker. Then moving into our panels, the first panel features authors who have put their own spin on some beloved Disney stories, J.J. Gilbert, author of The Mouse Watch, Alyssa Moon, author of Delphine and the Silver Needle, Estelle Lore, author of City of Villains, and uh, Emma Terrio, author of The Queen's Council, Rebel Rose. Our own Julia Smith from Booklist will be moderating that panel. The second panel will include some of our Rick Riordan Presents authors, J.C. Cervantes from the Stormrunner series, Sarawat Chatta, author of City of the Plague God, and Kwame Mbalia, the Tristan Strong series. Taylor K. Mejia, author of Paolo Santiago and the River of Tears, was supposed to join us today, um, but she lives in Oregon, and unfortunately the wildfires there have knocked out her internet, and she's keeping a close eye on things around her. So we just want her to focus on staying safe and not have to worry about anything else. So she really is sorry to, not to be able to join us today, but she's with us in spirit, and we're all thinking about her as well. Stephanie Laurie, the editorial director of Rick Riordan Presents, will be the moderator for that. All right, I'm gonna kick it over to the editors to get started with our book buzz. Hi everyone. So we'll start with our first picture book here. If you wanna to go to the next slide. Uh, I'm so excited to share with you our third Rocket and Group picture book by Brendan Deneen and Kale Atkinson, which just went on sale this week. Snow Day for Groot follows our favorite Marvel odd couple on a wintry visit to New York with their favorite, with their friendly neighborhood uh, tour guide, Spider-Man. For extra fun, readers can engage in a little seek and find with Ant-Man and the Wasp throughout. Next slide. Like Star Wars books you do? Your kids' young Padawan training they want, hmm? Okay, I promise I'm done, but this adorable picture book from the star team of Preeti Cheever and Mike Dias will have all your little ones wanting to speak like Yoda. A Jedi You Will Be is set to hit shelves this October, just in time for the 40th anniversary of Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back. Narrated by the one and only Yoda, this picture book is perfect for lifelong fans of the Star Wars franchise looking to bring the next generation into the world of the Jedi. Bring a little of the Force into your classrooms and libraries this fall. Next. I Want to Sleep Under the Stars by Mo Willems. Join Zumi and the rest of the Squirrel Pals for a night under the stars in the third book of Mo Willems' Unlimited Squirrels series. Zoom Squirrel dreams of sleeping under the night stars, and the Squirrel Pals are excited to help, but will their encouragement be enough or too much? As with the other two titles in Unlimited Squirrels, I Lost My Tooth and Who is the Mystery Reader, I Want to Sleep Under the Stars combines comedic narrative stories with surprising nonfiction content. Acorny jokes, quizzes, stories, and more await. The nonfiction sections in this book focus on star facts and facts about sleep. Readers will also be able to explore more nonfiction content at unlimitedsquirrels.com. This book and the rest of the Unlimited Squirrel series are perfect for fans of Elephant and Piggy who are ready for a little more of a challenge. 
until October 6, 2020. Next. Now we have the fifth and final installment of Rick Riordan's number one New York Times best-selling Trials of Apollo series. Oh. <laughs> uh, so we'll, we'll have Lester and Meg returning to where it all began, Camp Half-Blood. Will former Greek god Apollo, aka Lester Papadopoulos, finally regain his place on Mount Olympus? Will his demigod master Meg have a last showdown with her father? Will this helpless mortal form of Apollo have to face his arch nemesis Python? And who will be on hand at Camp Half-Blood to assist? Get ready for excitement of mythical proportions when the Tower of Nero goes on sale this October. Next. Okay, so now we're gonna take a minute to talk about um, the upcoming Rick Riordan Presents titles. We are now up to 28 star reviews as the Rick Riordan Presents imprint continues to awe readers and rack up reviews. On sale this season are Tristan Strong Destroys the World, City of the Plague God, and Aru Shah and the City of Gold. Fast-paced action and a healthy helping of humor make Rick Riordan Presents books great for voracious and reluctant readers alike. Um, I have a brief little bit about each one. So <laughs> Tristan Strong Destroys the World by Kwame Mbalia um, is a highly anticipated follow-up to his New York Times bestselling debut, Tristan Strong Punches a Hole in the Sky. After his adventures in Alpha, the land of African-American folk heroes and African gods, Tristan returns home to find that his beloved grandmother has been abducted by a mysterious villain out for revenge. Tristan and his loudmouth sidekick, Gum Baby, must reunite to rescue Nana and prevent further destruction. And that goes on sale October 6, 2020. City of the Plague God by Cyril Chada. City of the Plague God is based on the Mesopotamian epic of Gilgamesh and starts a 13-year-old Iraqi-American named Sikander. Sik lives with his family in New York City, just a normal boy living a normal life, until it is revealed that he is immortal and must team up with the hero Gilgamesh to save the city from the ancient god of plagues. On sale January 12, 2021. And then we also have Arusha and the City of Gold by Rashni Chakshi. And then this is the fourth and penultimate book in the Pandava series. Arusha and her sisters must find their mentors in Lanka, the City of Gold, before war breaks out between the Devas and the Asuras. Aru knows, she's made, knows that she's made a wish on the Tree of Wishes, but if only she could remember what it was. The devious god, dangerous trials, and the wondrous magic fans have come to love. This latest Arusha adventure will leave readers wishing they could read the finale immediately. On sale, April 6, 2021. Next. The Foul Twins Deny All Charges. The second adventure in this spinoff of Owen Coulter's blockbuster Artemis Fowl series starts with a bang. Literally, when Artemis Fowl's little, little brothers Miles and Beckett borrow the Fowl jet without permission, and it ends up as a fireball over Florida. Booklist calls this a treat for Fowl fans, and, it, and it'll be available October 20th. We're also coming out with an all-new full-color graphic novel adaptation of the second book in the Artemis series next March. Next slide, please. It's Mice in Black meets Mission Impossible. You've heard of the Rescue Rangers, now meet the Mouse Watch. This highly skilled and lowly statured team of crime-fighting mice work together to save humanity from the shadows. Using the greatest and smallest spy technology available, the Mouse Watch must protect the world from the evil rats that threaten our very existence. Action-packed and constantly entertaining, the first novel in the Mouse Watch series will captivate middle grade reluctant readers who are used to watching adventures on the big and small screen. J.J. Gilbert, a cartoon animator himself, brings this epic tale to life with humor and excitement while his spot illustrations within will have every kid wanting to sign up to join the Mouse Watch today. This story is only the beginning with two following books planned to take our fierce little friends to the deepest depths of the ocean and the farthest reaches of our galaxy. You won't want to miss a second of this exciting new series. Next. Star Wars High Republic Test of Courage by Justina Ireland. Before the Clone Wars, the Empire, or the First Order, there was a time when Jedi led the galaxy in what was known as the High Republic. Test of Courage, an illustrated middle grade novel by, by Justina Ireland, follows an all new cast of characters in this new chapter of Star Wars lore. Renestra Roa has become a Jedi Knight at age 15, but her first real assignment is underwhelming. 
She's tasked with supervising an 11-year-old aspiring inventor named Avon Stars on a cruiser headed to a new space station, the Starlight Beacon. It doesn't seem like she'll have much chance to prove herself, but when bombs explode on the cruiser, Ernestra, Avon, Avon's droid, a Jedi Padawan, and an ambassador's son must take an escape shuttle and flee while the adult Jedi tried to save the ship. Ernestra and company decide to land on a nearby moon for shelter, but little do they know that danger lurks in the forest. This book is great for Star Wars fans looking to dive into the newest era in the Star Wars universe. Justina Ireland has also written two other middle grade Star Wars books, Lando's Luck and Spark of the Resistance. And Test of Courage goes on sale January 5th, 2021. Next. The smash hit High School Musical, The Musical, The Series made a splash on Disney Plus this past fall and delighted audiences both old and new. It's clear the appeal of High School Musical is timeless. Take that with the number one New York Times bestselling author, Melissa De La Cruz, and you have a winning number. This completely new original novel takes place between the action of season one and the forthcoming season two of the television series. On the heels of their wildly successful run of High School Musical, the gang learns of a High School Musical convention a state over. There's something for everyone there, but as they soon find out, road trips aren't easy, and amid car troubles, late starts, and even a lost EJ, the gang has to find their way back or turn back around. High School Musical The Musical The Road Trip is a rompy fun time that brings back all your favorite characters on a new adventure. So get ready, Wildcats. This is sure to be the one you've been looking for. Next. Meet Delphine, a brave young dressmaker mouse living in the walls of Cinderella's chateau who makes an incredible discovery. The magical tailor mice of legend really existed, but a fearsome rat king is out to harness their magic for himself. So Delphine will have to embark on an epic quest with unlikely allies, including a pompous noble mouse, to claim her identity and save her kingdom. Readers will meet this tiny hero with a very big heart next March, and a sequel is also in the works and you'll hear more from author Alyssa Moon soon. Next slide. Now we move into our young adult titles. Next. The Mirror. The Mirror is a groundbreaking YA series that takes everything you think you know about fairy tales and flips it on its head. Following one family and the curse that plagues it over several generations, each book is set in a, in a unique era from 1800s Germany to 1920s New Orleans to 1960s San Francisco and to early 2000s New York. We have four stellar YA authors at the helm of each title, starting with Julie C. Dow, Danielle Clayton, J.C. Cervantes, and L. McKinney. Playing upon classic fairy tale tropes, the series grows more complex and diverse as, a, as the books go on. Broken Wish kicks off the series as we follow 16-year-old Elva, whose burgeoning powers are becoming harder and harder to hide. But when she witnesses a devastating vision of the future, she knows she has to tap into her magic to stop it from coming true. As Elva learns more about her powers, the lines between hero and villain start to blur and she must find a way to right past wrongs before it's too late. Dow's first book in the series is sure to wow and captivate YA readers looking for a new spin within the fantasy genre on sale this October. Frozen 2, Dangerous Secrets, The Story of Iduna and Agnon, by Mari Mancusi. In Frozen 2, the secret of Anna and Elsa's heritage was revealed, and the origins of Elsa's powers explained. But how did their parents meet and fall in love? Dangerous Secrets explores the story of Iduna and Agnon. A friends to lovers tale seasoned with deceit, murder, and court intrigue, this book is perfect for Frozen fans ages 12 and up. On sale November 3rd, 2020. Next. See the Disney princesses like never before in The Queen's Council, an epic new historical fantasy series that sees your favorite heroines become the queens they were destined to be in the time period they were meant to be in. This sophisticated upper YA series centers on our recently crowned queens as they come into power and learn what it takes to care for their people. Our first entrance into the series is with Emma Terrio's Rebel Rose. Based on Beauty and the Beast, Rebel Rose puts readers right into the middle of the French Revolution, where Belle finds herself torn between her new royal life and her provincial roots. 
filled with political intrigue, romance, and a touch of magic, this novel is a perfect book for fans of epic royal fantasies a la Kendara Blake and Victoria Aveyard, and for Disney fans, old and new, on sale this November. Next. Ned Ficini's modern classic is having a major pop culture moment with a musical adaptation that led to over 150 million Spotify streams of the soundtrack worldwide and a, to and a Tony nomination for the Broadway production. It's been incredible to see the ways in which this story continues to strike a chord with today's teens, 16 years after its initial publication. This graphic novel adaptation by New York Times bestselling author David Levithan and illustrator Nick Bartozzi perfectly captures the quirkiness, humor, and emotion at the heart of the story. And David also wrote an afterword to talk about Be More Chill's journey from book to musical to graphic novel. Readers can dig in when it comes out January 5th next year. Next slide. Lore by Alexandra Bracken. With Lore, Alex Bracken, the best-selling author of the Darkest Mind series, presents a gritty YA take on Greek mythology. Every seven years, the Greek gods and goddesses must walk the earth as mortals in the Aegon, punishment for a past rebellion. During the Aegon, descendants of the ancient bloodlines hunt these gods with the chance to kill them and take their place, claiming divine powers and immortality for themselves. Lore, one of these descendants, fled after her family's brutal murder at the hands of a rival bloodline, hoping to leave that world behind forever. But on the eve of the Aegon, two participants seek her out and ask for help. Castor, the childhood friend Lore believed long dead, and Athena, gravely wounded and one of the last remaining original gods. For the chance to escape the Aegon once and for all, Lore binds her fate to Athena's, a decision that comes at a deadly price, and still might not be enough to stop a new god from wreaking havoc on humanity. Suspense, mythology, romance, and bloodlust collide in this set sophisticated page turner on sale January 5th, 2021. Um, we're also flagging that Brightly Woven, um, Alex's debut novel, has been reimagined as an upper middle grade graphic novel by adapter Lee Dragoon and illustrator Kit Seaton. And it's perfect for fans of the Amulet graphic novel series and Howl's Moving Castle. That goes on sale February 2nd, 2021. Next. City of Villains is the dark and edgy Disney YA series you've been looking for. Blending the dark magic of Disney's most infamous villains with a gritty modern day crime noir, this novel follows a troubled teenage detective as she discovers the reimagined origins of such villains like Maleficent, Ursula, and Captain Hook. Mary Elizabeth is a high school senior by day, but by night, she's an intern at the Monarch City Police Department. When a young socialite goes missing, Mary Elizabeth is put on the case, but soon finds herself falling down the rabbit hole of a city in turmoil. Both magical and unpredictable, Estelle Lore's City of Villains brings the mystery in this fresh take on some of Disney's most beloved baddies. See your favorite villains like never before in this first novel of a three book series set to come out February 2nd, 21. Next. Continuing to build on the stories of the High Republic era, 200 years before the Skywalker saw Skywalker Saga, this YA novel by Claudia Gray follows Padawan Wraith Silas as he's sent to the under, undeveloped frontier, though he'd rather stay at the Jedi Temple studying the archives. But when his ship is knocked out of hyperspace in a galactic-wide disaster, Wraith finds himself on, on a mysterious space station where all is not as it seems. With the huge following of the Mandalorian series on Disney Plus and other original tales in the Star Wars realm, we're sure this highly anticipated new story will find enthusiastic fans when it comes out next February. Next slide. Thank you so much, Heather, Christine, Cassidy. That was amazing. You guys are great. I'm going to have you do all of my book buzzes from now on. <laughs> uh, just a reminder to everybody that we are limited on the number of physical galleys that we can mail out these days. Um, but most of our galleys are up on NetGalley for you to request. And these are all the other places you can find us online with our website, our catalog, and on social media. Now let's get over to our first panel. Take it away, Julia. Thank you, Dina. I would like to please welcome to the screen, Alyssa, Jason, Emma, and Estelle. So we can get our first group of authors up here. And yes, do we have everyone? Let me just check. 
Yes, I see everyone. Okay, fantastic. Even though you all did just get a, a little intro to your books in this buzz, I would like for you all to just sort of describe them quickly so that everyone remembers because so many great titles were just mentioned. So we could kick off with Jason. Hey, how are you? <laughs> so uh, <laughs> this is a back to our Brady Bunch zone here. But um, yeah, no, um, the Mouse Watch is super exciting. I'm so happy to get to share this with you. So being a Disney animator, I have uh, been working in the art side for a long time, but I always loved the Rescue Rangers and I liked um, the Rescuers. I mean, real classic, right? And then uh, Men in Black and Mission Impossible all kind of made it come together in a really unique new way. And I thought, gosh, to have these tiny little heroes working behind the scenes where you never see them, but they're day-to-day -day saving the world got my brain really percolating. So it's kind of like, um, yeah, they, they kind of said it well when they said it's sort of like Mission Impossible meets Mice in Black. And it's <laughs> totally action packed and full of tiny gadgets that are shrunk down to mice size. And you know, whether a mouse needs a paper clip and a fishing line to do a, a zip line or to have an iPad that's this tiny, it just makes that whole world kind of like the borrowers really exciting and fun to play in. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, Emma, let's have you go next. Hi. Hi, I'm Emma Terrio. Um, I wrote Rebel Rose, which is a continuation of Belle's story as she takes on the responsibility of becoming queen and learns to balance duty, love, and sacrifice, all while navigating dark political intrigue. It does take place just before the French Revolution begins and a touch of Disney magic. Perfect. Next, we'll go to Alyssa. Hi, I'm Alyssa Moon, and I'm the author of Delphine and the Silver Needle. And Delphine is a brand new character who lives in the world of Cinderella. She's a dressmaker mouse from Cinderella Chateau. And she stumbles upon a big secret about the magical tailor mice that everybody thought were just legend. Oh, okay. Sorry, I wasn't sure you were still going on. Um, our, our final well, king rat wants the magic that she's only now discovering as. Technical difficulties? <laughs> I think so. All right. Let's pause on Alyssa. I think she has frozen for the moment. Um, can we get Estelle? Sure. Um, so I wrote City of Villains, which is a trilogy. It's like a dark, gritty, um, really fun, uh, noir kind of location setting, Monarch City. And it's about a girl who is a high school student during the day. And then at night she has an internship at Monarch City Police Department. Her dream is to be a detective. And when a schoolmate goes missing, she gets pulled onto the case because there's this sort of, um, her neighborhood is very, um, is very closed in and closed off and doesn't like outsiders. So they use the fact that she's from the neighborhood to pull her into the case. And uh, when the story opens, magic has been dead for about 10 years, but, the question is, is magic truly dead? And no, because it, <laughs> magic is never dead. So that's, that's how that story starts. Um, springboards from there. Great. Thank you. I love that. I think we have Alyssa back. Hi. And yes. I, did I cut out in the middle? You did. But what I'm going to do is just move on to my next question and start with you and you can continue your description and then go into, because my next question is really just to all of you, what was it like to write in these worlds that are sort of classic and already created or to take the established character? Um, you know, is that super hard? Is it really fun? I'm sure there are challenges to it. 
So yes, I'll start with you, Alyssa. That is the perfect segue for this book because it is, it's again about uh, this little mouse who lives in Cinderella's Chateau and Disney always creates magical worlds and we've all grown up with them. And I think the world of Cinderella and what we see of the mice in the movie is so compelling. And I always wanted to learn more. I think we all wanted to learn more about those mice and what they do in their everyday lives and what that whole world is with the animals of that kingdom. And so that is really where this book comes in and it tells that story. And Cinderella and what happens to her is a, a bit of a thread. There's a lot of great Easter eggs for fans, um, but it's really about how that same message from the film of kindness and caring and the importance of those things, how those can impact and be true for anybody, even the littlest, tiniest heroes. And in the same way that Cinderella comes from the everyday and really becomes fantastic and discovers her true worth, Delphine does as well. And I think that, that getting that chance to play in that world and explore it, but still remain within the walls of what the Disney fans know and love and be really true and authentic to that, mm -hmm. uh, that's, a, that's a really special thing to get to do. I love that. Um, let's see how other people are feeling about it. We will jump to Emma. Uh, yes, yeah, so it obviously an immense privilege to be able to continue the story of a Disney princess. I'm sure we've all spent most of our childhoods and adulthoods imagining what happens next for a lot of them. So yeah, like I said, and it, it was a huge privilege. Um, Belle is such a solid character that I didn't find it difficult imagining her in, say, like pre-revolutionary Paris, where she's, you know, espousing the ideals of Enlightenment thinkers. And, you know, like her character is so solid, it's not hard. Um, but it was, you have to be careful, of course, because she lives in your head and she's a character that exists already, but she's not yours, even though I felt pretty possessive of her as I was writing it. <laughs> but um, yeah, so getting to expand her world, so to speak, you know, Belle spends so much of the, the animated film wanting more and stuff like that. So Rebel Rose opens in Paris, um, was such a privilege and such a joy for me. And I was a history major in university, so uh, it was truly like the perfect project for me. Like I, I love Belle, I love history, and I get to <laughs> mash the two of them together. And it's certainly an upheaval for her. It's the French Revolution after all. So yeah, I would just really reiterate that it was a huge privilege and I am so grateful that I was able to take on the challenge. Thank you. Estelle, um, yours is set up a little differently than, than these because you kind of pull in a variety of characters. So let's, will you fill us in on that? Yeah, so I spent a lot of time on the Disney fandom pages because <laughs> even though I wanted to know everything that had ever been done with these characters because we're sort of reimagining origins and also taking them and imagining them as teenagers. So I have Belle in mine, Emma, too. And <laughs> I had the most fun with her character. She's She is really solid and she does like giving her a look that would be a modern look oh, pulling nice. her out of that time period you know all that kind of stuff was super fun and then i always had this obsession with the villains too so um so it was really great to actually be able to deal with characters like maleficent and ursula and um you know pull them into into uh, being teenagers like what is their what are their romantic lives like what are they what do they want outside of these magical kind of um things that they goals that they have and um and for me it was nerve-wracking but also just so much fun to have this base to start from and then to expand from there and really um my editor gave me so much freedom i don't know about you guys but i had the best time being able to just explore so thank you and jason hey well you know first of all all these sound great i think i'm gonna need to buy a copy of each of these books because <laughs> you guys I just love them. And Alyssa, boy, Kindra Spirits, something about the mice. They're so good, I right? And they're so I, good. I mean, they're, you know, something about, I guess, from Mickey onwards, that Disney and mice have always been just 
together. And they're such empathetic little creatures. And so getting a chance to take Gadget Hack Wrench from Rescue Rangers, now she's middle-aged, you know, she's, um, you know, been around a while. She, she did that in her youth and she had to start her own super secret organization. And because she was so gadget oriented anyway, that was a big priority. So, I mean, from all the James Bond stuff we've seen, it was just neat to see her take the reins with that kind of innovation and go, what could she come up with that could fight this evil empire of rats? And um, they are the Rogue Animal Thieves Society, rats conveniently. <laughs> and so, uh, so they're out there, you know, trying to do their nefarious plans. And uh, so sometimes for me to get ideas while I'm working, I'll sit and draw because, you know, it's, you know, actually I was like last night working on a, on a little sketch of Bernie here. But sometimes to get the character and get their voices in my head, I need to animate them or move them around. So part of my process was dipping back into the well I know in animation and then trying to make them live in my head and on the page. So it's been so much fun. That is wonderful. <laughs> I just caught one question in the chat, I think that I was gonna throw out there anyway, which is just a very brief one, hop in at any time, but are these all series books? Mm -hmm. yep, yes, City Everybody. Yep. Oh, that's great. Okay. Fantastic. So we can really get to know these characters. Uh, uh, with mine, I'll just say the mm -hmm. Queen's Council series will be a different princess and a different author for each book. So after oh. mine, next year, there's a Mulan book by Livia Blackburn. So just saying. Cool. <laughs> no, that's great to know. Yeah. So I would like to... Uh, bring up the question of, um, I was looking across and we've got two middle grade books and two YA and in general, those age groups kind of tackle different themes, but I think in all of them, you kind of get underdog stories and um, the idea of empowerment or empathy and like, how do either of these play a role in your book? And um, why do you feel like stories that exemplify those things are important for young readers? So if anyone just wants to jump in. I'll go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think if um, that uh, City of Villains deals a lot, well, any story with YA and why I love to do YA is because it, um, it gives a chance to look at one of the most disempowered time periods uh, in your lifetime, which is when you're a teenager. Um, you have all these urges to do things that are adult, but you're not quite there yet. And society puts a lot of restrictions on you and you actually don't have a lot of power. And so I love this mashup of the Disney universe and the magic, because what is more empowering than magic? <laughs> Suddenly you're not only, you know, powerful like a regular person, you're more powerful, but then how you wield that, I mean, it serves as a really good metaphor for adulthood and how it feels to be an adult and to have that type of responsibility and, and deal with bigger issues and bigger things. And I, so I love, that's why I love writing YA. And then when you add in the magical elements, it's just the most fun. And I think through reading these stories, it's super important for teenagers because, because they're disempowered when they can read these stories, they get that inspired feeling like they could go do something or, you know, the world could be different than it is, or they can fight for a cause or whatever it is. So I think those stories are incredibly key. And if you can kind of do it in a way that they don't even know that's a lesson that's being passed on to them, <laughs> that's the best case scenario. So. Definitely. That's really good. You know, in my case, I was really trying to deal with the identity issues kids have at nine to 12, where they're trying to figure out how they fit. And mm -hmm. they might be a little different. Like my main character, Bernie, she's, you know, she's tough, resilient, but has a hard time in her typical social settings. And she's so intense, uh, kind of puts a lot of people off. 
So when she kind of finds the mouse watch, she kind of finds a place where she fits in because the metaphor in the book is a watch is made of all kinds of different parts and you need all of them together to make it work and keep time. And so the watch has that double meaning of they're both watching and they are like a watch. And when it's all working, it works great. So I really wanted kids to find their place and to feel that sense of everyone, no matter how unique their part is. You could be the face of the clock, but you could also be a mainstream or a tiny gear and be equally important, so. Yeah, yeah with um, over the course of Rebel Rose, Belle has, it's not really a spoiler to say, like, you know, we all know how much empathy Belle has as a character. Um, so her journey is discovering how she can use her voice and her privilege and her power uh, in order to make her world a better place. Um, it's the French Revolution, there's a lot going on. She is torn between, like they said in the preview, torn between her past as a commoner and her future as a royal. She kind of rejects it entirely. She doesn't want to be a queen. So her journey through the book is one of like owning that and I guess empowering herself and realizing that you know being queen isn't just a title, it's something that can make her world a better place. And in the animated film, Belle has to, as we all know, see past the darkness in someone and find the light within. And in my book, she has to do the same sort of thing. And I think it's important, obviously, like um, Estelle said, that kids are able to internalize a lot of this and not necessarily be preached at, but they are themes that are super important in our time for sure. And I tried my best to make it less in your face, but uh, I love writing stories about empowerment and empathy anyway. So it was, it was really easy with Belle. I love that all four of our books have uh, female main characters. Mm -hmm. And that in itself, I think is so empowering that we have more of these books. And one of the things I love about Delphine that she comes from the world of Cinderella is that, you know, Cinderella is very feminine and she embraces that and that's part of who she is. And so is Delphine. And she also discovers that she can kick butt and do awesome magic. But it doesn't change the fact that at her heart, she loves being a girl and you can be both. And I think that that is something that is a, is a really important message to put out there. And also this idea that, um, that a lot of times adventure is thrust upon you. Um, and that's something that, especially for kids, you know, Estelle, your point about being disempowered is such a good point. And for so many kids, they don't choose to go out and get embroiled in these situations they're dealing with. Um, it's thrust upon them and you rise to the occasion. And that's what happens to Delphine. She suddenly discovers that she's being chased by rats that want her head. She has no idea why. She can't go home. She doesn't know where to go. She doesn't know what to do. She's never lived out in the woods before. And she has to figure it out and she does. You know, she, she rolls up her little mouse sleeves and she gets to work. And that's a really good lesson to learn that when something difficult happens, you don't have to let it crush you. You can rise to the occasion. You can, you can succeed. Oh, you guys, that was great. Um, I think we have time for maybe one last question. So let me see. I would like to hear who you think, I know that anyone can read any story, but for librarians trying to match these books with readers at first, who would you say would make a good audience or reader for your book in particular? Um, let's just let's start with, yes, Alyssa. Oh, I would say um, readers that have liked Spiderwick Chronicles, uh, Inkheart as well, um, Ember in the Ashes, a little bit older, but I think that those readers still connect with that idea of the strong female characters and of course classics like Despero and the Redwall series, right? Anybody that loves those little animals. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Emma? Yeah, so We've been pitching it as Disney Princess meets The Crown, which I think is really apt. Um, it would be appealing to anybody who's looking for a continuation of like a widening of the world for Disney princesses or a more mature story that goes a bit beyond what the movies did. Like obviously the themes in line include the French Revolution struggles and stuff like that. So I think it would appeal to anybody who like adult, young reader alike, um, yeah, like, like I said, it's Disney Princess Meets the Crown. It's the best way to describe it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> fantastic. 
Estelle, how about you? Um, so mine, I think, would appeal to fans of like Pretty Little Liars, Jessica Jones, Vampire Diaries, you know, your dark, broody teen. Um, <laughs> and also any adults who like procedurals or mysteries. It's not fully a mystery, but you know, those, those kinds of readers. Fantastic. Jason? Well, this is definitely for the spy school crowd and uh, Artemis Fowl and that kind of thing. I mean, it's just high octane, big adventure on a small scale. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Okay, that is a wrap for us. Thank you guys so, so much for talking with us today. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going fun. to pass things over now for our next part of the, or I guess our next panel. So let's see. Yes, so Stephanie Laurie, editor of Rick Rorden Presents. She will get things going now. Great. Hi, everybody. So can we get Jen on here and Kwame and Sarwat? We're representing New Mexico and North Carolina and Great Britain. And let's see if I can see you guys. Yeah. So as Julia said to her previous panel, you saw a little intro to your book, but I'd love the audience to hear from you directly. So if you were in an elevator with a librarian, what would your elevator pitch be? And I'm gonna go in pub order. So we'll start with Jen. Okay, gosh, I'm terrible at pitches, but I will give it, I will give it my best shot. Um, I would say that the Storm in a series centers around a young boy who lives in New Mexico and has a physical disability that does not define him. And he soon finds that he is at the center of an ancient Maya prophecy where he is foretold to re release the God of death, darkness, and destruction to which he says, no way, but of course he does. And we find out why. And he goes on an incredible adventure of magic, mayhem, and all kinds of misunderstandings with gods and monsters and giants and elushes and shapeshifters and of course, demons. Perfect. Mr. Mabalia. Um, if I had to pitch the Tristan Strong series, um, similar to Jen, I would say that it is about a boy who discovers that African-American gods and uh, African folk, African-American folktales and African gods exist and that he has the power to shape stories uh, and carry them forth. And in book two, you know, it's all great. In book one, we've saved the world. Everything is fantastic. We're heroes. Yes. And book two is more about discovering the trauma afterwards and how do we process and deal with that. Great. Sarwat? Um, I thought I'd take the most ridiculous, impossible idea imaginable, which is what would happen if a mysterious disease popped out of nowhere and <laughs> decided to infect everybody? How would people manage to deal with that? Um, in my version, um, you've got 13-year-old Sikunda Aziz, an American-born Muslim kid who has to team up with the ancient Mesopotamian gods and heroes to take out the big villain of the piece that is the disease god Nurgle before the disease the magical disease infects absolutely everybody but he's starting with his hometown which is Manhattan so we have the, you to blame for all this I guess but <laughs> I love how the last panel was all female heroines and this is all male. So we're balancing it out. So now I wanna just dig a little deeper and ask you to talk about the themes in your book and you can talk about your most recent one. And I'll start with Jen again. Oh gosh, you know, I, I think that the theme, it actually runs through all three of the books is this sense of belonging who you are, what is your identity, how do you navigate this world? Um, and then there are themes of loyalty and, and uh, family and friendship, but also a theme of, you know, I, I love hearing Kwame bring up story. There's this theme of 
whose history is it to tell? Who defines that history? Which lens are we going to look through? Great. Kwame? Um, well, this one is easy for me because I, I have to sit down and, and think about the theme before I start a book. Otherwise, I just wander around lost aimlessly. Um, for me, in book two specifically, the theme is about um, trauma and diaspora and how sometimes the two can be intertwined via the separation of one from one's own people and culture and the rediscovery of that. Uh, and so in book two, Tristan, um, sometimes simultaneously, sometimes uh, separately on different occasions, he discovers, learns, and begins to understand how trauma and diaspora uh, can go hand in hand. Perfect. Farwa? Um, I mean, it's the most obvious theme in plenty of children's books, and that's um, anyone can be a hero. And, you know, it's not about strength, magical powers, being able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. It's just about being there, no matter how scared or overwhelming the danger may be, and standing up for the people that you care about. And so in a nutshell, that was the, that was a theme for Play God. Beautiful. So I wanted to ask you all about representation. You're all representing different groups. Uh, in Sarawak's case, it's the Muslim community for the first time in all your books. Uh, in Kwame's case, it's African American and African mythology and folklore. And Jen is talking about Maya and Aztec and Mexica culture and also the uh, physically challenged. So I'd like to hear from all of you about how much you thought about that as you're writing, uh, why you felt it was important, or any issues you might have faced as, real, as a result of having to represent a culture. So I'll start with Sarwat this time. Um, I've been published now for over 10 years, and from the very beginning, I was constantly pondering how to do a Muslim protagonist, uh, mainly because for the last thousand years or so, Muslim, we Muslims have been seen as the villains of the West. And I didn't want to present a book that was about the Muslim experience because I don't believe there is a monolithic Muslim experience. And that's, so it needs to be something heroic, something fun, but that still kept the core of um, a modern Muslim kid's life, rather than the idea that he represented any great, um, a great population of the globe. And so for me, the, the theme was, really, um, tied up with the theme, was, yeah, Muslim kids being heroes and being proud of that rather than the feeling that, you know, they're always cast as the villains and there's no space for them to sort of seize the day and, you know, um, grab the crown. And so I thought that was really the key thing. And I wanted to do it without the idea that it was an angsty, baggage-filled, worthy novel, for the want of a better word. It's just meant to be a great rip-roaring adventure. Great. How would you answer that, Kwame? Um, I would answer it by saying that, you know, I never, uh, I didn't think about um, how necessarily representation as I was going into writing the book, I was just, or I was talking about experience, um, something that um, no one, no one person or no two people will share the same experience. And so it's all about presenting, you know, a seventh grader's experience through his eyes and seeing people relate to that. Um, the idea of Tristan, the Tristan Strong series is all about a story. And so my point was to tell a good story and to leave nuggets of information inside of that story that people will latch on to and then go explore. And they will go see how that relates to their own experience. You know, I've had feedback from adults and children um, saying that I didn't know about this person or I knew about this person, but not that particular story. And, or, you know, my mother told me these stories or my father, or my grandfather, I sat around the fire and listened to the Anansi tales. And so it's less about representing everyone and more about 
showing people that they can find themselves, their own experiences inside of a story. Um, and doing that just, you know, through an African-American boy who's facing his own troubles. I love that answer. I think that's the perfect answer that we're telling great stories, hope they reach a lot of people, but not meaning to represent a whole culture. Jen, what do you yeah. have to say? I, I think that I would absolutely um, echo what Kwame's talking about. You know, as authors, we want to tell compelling tales and we want our readers to be lost in those tales in whatever capacity that they that they want to, you know, a couple of things. I, um, I'm of Mexican descent. I, I grew up near the border in California and my grandmother used to tell me these stories. And I was really obsessed with mythology as a kid. I, I mean, just completely obsessed with Roman Greek mythology, which is what was available to me. And so when she would tell me these tales, I was, they were gripping. I mean, I just, I thought about them all the time. And I can remember going into the library. I was in the third grade and I asked my librarian, for books on the Maya and Aztec and Mesoamerican mythology. And I was immediately told that there was none. And so I can remember so clearly walking out thinking, and I don't think that I was disheartened by it. I think it was just a matter of fact. And I walked out thinking, hmm, well, they must not be important because they're not in a book and only things that are important get made into books. And so, you know, fast forward many, many years, it's been such an incredible honor to get to bring these stories to life and to to show, I think, also Mexican Americans in a view that is not necessarily a pain narrative or not necessarily an immigrant story. And those are important stories to tell. Please don't misinterpret that. But I also want to see, you know, uh, Latinx children having joyful adventures and, and going through all the things that we as human beings go through. And it doesn't necessarily have to be defined by that particular culture. So, so that was my take on it. Absolutely. And you've done that. Good job. So I have two more questions for the group. The first is there's so many imprints popping up all the time now and many are devoted to diversity. What made Rick Riordan Presents stand out for you as a place that you wanted to come to? And I'm gonna start with Kwame this time. Um, I, the, easy, the easy answer is that Rick, um, has always been one of my favorite authors. Uh, I read um, The Lightning Thief uh, when it first debuted. The, the, my mother uh, is my book buddy uh, ever since I was very little. You know, she would always take us to the library on Fridays to pick up books, but she would also just randomly, she would buy me the first book in a series to see if it was something I was interested in. Um, she was like, oh, you know, Kwame, I picked something up at the store. And one of those books happened to be, this This still goes on. It, it continues, you know, it's, <laughs> it's you, you're never, you're not your mother's baby. Uh, and so one of the books happened to be The Lightning Thief. And I read it again, like Jen, I was a huge fan of mythology. And so to see uh, contemporary um, young people dealing with and living in a world where mythology existed, coexisted, was absolutely fantastic. And so to be able to get a chance to do um, for others what the Lightning Thief did for me is an experience that I, I could never turn down. And to do it at an imprint with Rick and with Steph and with other lovely authors, um, well, yeah, I guess I'll include Jen and Sarwat in that um, <laughs> as a part of the experience. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a dream come true. I, I wouldn't change it for the world. Well, thank you. We're so privileged to have all of you. I'll, I'll, take, the check. I'll take the check afterwards. <laughs> Jen, you're next. Well, I'm going to uh, disinvite Kwame to my writing studio after this conference. <laughs> 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 um, it, was, it was easy. I mean, like Kwame, you know, I've been reading Rick's work for a long time, not just The Lightning Thief, but the Red Pyramid series and my favorite, the Magnus Chase series. And just really consider him such an incredible magical storyteller that to see him utilizing his platform in that way was, I mean, Kwame put it right. I mean, it's just an absolute dream come true. And then I had met Steph, she may not remember, um, you know, many, many, many years ago at an SCBWI and she's so highly, you are so highly thought of. Um, the opportunity to get to work with Steph Laurie was like, sign me up right now, immediately. Um, and to get to learn from her. And so, um, I feel we were talking about you in third person, but anyway. Um, oh, I wasn't fishing for compliments when I wrote this question, but thank you. <laughs> I know, I know you weren't fishing for compliments. Phil <laughs> and I often tell people like I've become a better writer just working on three books with Steph. Oh. And so, and then you've got the whole Disney team, right? What yeah, Disney yeah. 
questions. And I just, I mean, cool. Sarwat? Well, I know this is becoming a bit of the Stephanie fan club. No, like, oh, no, no, no. Go back to Rick. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I just, I'll tell you what it is. Because it's the Rick Ryden imprint, it us absorbing and trying to build upon the sense of fun that he always has in all of his books. Yeah. yeah? And it slightly goes back to my first comment where, you know, a lot of, and as Jen also said, that there are books that should appropriately deal with, you know, the difficulties of being of one particular ethnic group or whatever, but that isn't me. And so what I want to do is just absolutely write the most fun book I possibly can. And actually picking on a mythology that hardly anybody dwells upon. In a similar way to Jen, if you're doing a Muslim character, the default is you take the Arabian Nights, you stick in a flying carpet and a couple of genies and you're there. And I thought, no, you know, that's been done really well by others. And so exploring Mesopotamian mythology actually made me feel that, wow, this is like fan rediscovering fantasy all over again. Mm. And, you know, it's down to you guys that gave me the chance to do it. And so, you know, um, just want to write the most fun magical adventures you possibly can, but something that actually means something um, deep within me. And actually, you know, getting the chance to write about the characters that I wanted to be when I was there, that age. Wow. Who could ask for anything more? Not all. <laughs> and get paid. <laughs> Even better. <laughs> <laughs> the last question is a, just a fun one. If Zayn Apispo, Tristan Strong, and Sikander Aziz were on a quest together, who do you think would be the leader and why? Mm. Nope, I'm not, I'm not answering it. <laughs> That's right. I, oh, you know, actually, God. go ahead, Sarwat. Go, go ahead, ahead Sarwat. Oh, okay. What is the quest? That, I think, is the bigger question because it would be a case of, you know, playing to our strengths depending on the situation, wouldn't it? And so, you know, and that's what's key about all our characters. We draw our strengths from the culture and the environment that we belong to. So that is where we would probably be the leader. And so, you know, a generic quest, I would almost say, you know, how could you possibly decide? You'd have to be more specific, Stephanie. How about going on a subway ride during the pandemic? That's the quest. <laughs> I don't think any of us are brave enough to do that. Excellent. You're all smart. <laughs> <laughs> any other ideas? I see a democratic union step. <laughs> well, that's who I am. <laughs> and so I see them working together for the greater good. But you're so competitive. I thought for sure you'd say, Zane, and you'd go down fighting. But I'm competitive with myself. Oh. <laughs> Me. I'm, I'm actually, and, and then my football teams and Rocky, but I still love <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna say gum baby would be the lady. Excellent answer. That's, yes. that's it. I think there's no question. She's the winner. Yeah. Well, thank you all so much. I'm sure the crowd got some insights into your books and to you, which is what we really wanted here. And uh, thanks again for the privilege of being able to publish you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Bye, I'm everyone. Turn it back over to Julia. Oh, thank you, Stephanie. And thank you to everyone who was on this webinar today. Tomorrow, all attendees will receive an email containing links to today's slide presentation, title list, certificate of completion, and video recording. For more about Booklist webinars, be sure to visit booklistonline.com slash webinars, where you can view archives of past webinars and register for upcoming ones like those you see here. If you haven't already, be sure to check out the Booklist Reader, where Booklist contributors post daily about all things books and library land. Did you know that Booklist is currently available for free until the end of the month? 
Start reading with our digital edition, a format that pairs the page-by-page -page reading experience of print with the convenience of online access at booklistonline.com. And lock in print, online, digital, and archive access by taking advantage of the special webinar offer to get Booklist for only $75. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. And one more thank you to our sponsor, Disney Publishing Worldwide. This concludes today's webinar.